quite quick. Okay. All right, for anybody that's listening, we're waiting to get started uh, with the planning commission hearing. We're still waiting for, oh, a quorum. And we, just, we just got a quorum. Here we are, we have four commissioners. Uh, we're still waiting for uh, Tori. For Tori, but we can still run the show uh, without her. So it will be all right. We'll, so we should go ahead and um, if you wanna do the, uh, the roll call. Jeff and get going. Well, welcome everyone to the uh, November 16th Planning Commission meeting. Um, we will start out with a Pledge of Allegiance. Randy, would you mind leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Of course. Uh, all the commissioners can mute. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the of United States of America, America and, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Randy, uh, Annette, can we get a roll call, please? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Commissioner Anderson? Here. Commissioner Hughes? Present. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Chairperson Van Den Eickhoff? Here. Um, for the record, uh, Commissioner Carranza and McIntyre are excused absences, and um, Commissioner Keene is not present yet, so we have four present. Commissioner Keene just texted me saying she's on her way. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, can I get an approval of the agenda, please? I will make that first motion. I'll second. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Commissioner Hughes? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Chairperson Van Den Eickhoff? Yes. Motion passes 4-0. Well, this time is reserved for public comment. This portion of the meeting um, is reserved for any person wishing to address the commission on any matter that's not on the agenda over which we may have jurisdiction. Speakers are limited to three minutes. Please state your name for the record before making your presentation. The commission may take action to direct staff to place the matter of business on a future agenda. Is there anybody in the, the uh, online or on the phone that would like to make a comment? A public <coughs> comment? So we have a few online. I don't see anybody using uh, the raise hand uh, to comment on an item not on the agenda this night. Okay. And we'll go ahead and close the public comment section and uh, move to the consent calendar. Um, all the items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and non-controversial by city staff and will be approved by one motion. No member of the commission or public wishes to comment or ask questions. Um, can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? Okay. Jason? I'll second. And Randy, thank you. Annette? Okay, Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Commissioner Hughes? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Commissioner Schmidt? You are muted. Yes. Thank you. Um, Chairperson Van Den Eickhoff? Yes. Motion passes 4-0. Okay. Um, we will go go ahead and enter our public hearing section for each of the following items the public will be given the opportunity to speak after a staff report the chair will open the public hearing and invite the applicant or applicant's representative to make any comments members of the public will be invited to provide testimony to the commission following the applicant speakers should state their name for the record and can address the commission for three minutes after all public comments have been received the public hearing will be closed and the commission will discuss their item and take appropriate actions um, so we'll start off with the ex parte. Um, Randy, do you have any ex parte on this item? No ex parte. Dennis? No ex parte. Jason? No ex parte. Okay. Uh, we did see this at DRC, so I've seen this once before. But, um, why don't we go ahead and turn our time over to, is it Mariah, are you giving the presentation? 
I am. Sorry, I had a hard time hitting that mute button. Okay, <laughs> let me go ahead and share my screen here. Can you all see my screen? Not yet. Okay, let me try that again. All right, yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so this project is for uh, what we're calling California Manor 2 at 10165 El Camino Real. The project number is DEV 21-0045. Uh, Mariah, before we, sorry to interrupt you, but Tori just came on and I wanted to make sure she doesn't have any ex parte on this item. Oh, sure. Tori, do you have any ex parte on this item? I have no ex parte on this item. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay, go ahead, Mariah. Thank you. So here we have the zoning map. We can see the parcel here is in the high density multifamily zone or RMF 24 with El Camino and the medium density residential zone to the west. Um, and then there's a little bit of commercial neighborhood to the north there. And then um, the park is a little bit further to the south. The property right now is a 4.7 acre lot. Part of the project that will be proposed tonight is to split this lot into two lots. The first would be 2.8 acres in the front and then there would be a flag lot of 1.9 acres in the back. And here we can see an aerial photo. Um, the, there is an existing building on the front of the site. And this project does also include building a new building on the rear portion where that star is. A little bit of background about the site. As I'd mentioned, the, uh, the site is currently developed with a two-story multifamily building that contains 95 units as well as an outdoor courtyard. These units are income restricted and rented at a low income level to uh, the senior population. And there are an existing 122 parking spaces on site. This project was presented to the design review committee just in October. Um, where they did make some recommendations with, that the applicant has addressed. And we'll go ahead and mention those when they come up. So the project being proposed is to develop a new 39 foot, eight inch tall, three-story building. This three-story building includes a rental office, storage areas, laundry facilities, a community room, as well as activity rooms, and then a new landscape courtyard. Um, there are 76 total units in the new building. This includes 12 studios, 58 one bedrooms and six two bedroom units. The project uh, includes removing a maintenance building that's on site as well as trees to be removed. And we'll go over that in um, a few slides. Again, this 4.7 acre lot is to be split into two parcels. One would have the existing building on it and the uh, the rear one would be for the new building. The applicant is adding 29 new parking spaces for a total of 151 parking spaces, which would be shared by both buildings. So to go over the subdivision a little bit, um, I would mentioned the size of the parcels already. The, um, the municipal code does require new lots to have access to the public right-of-way. So the lot was created as a flag lot. We can see here um, the net acreage of both is over the half acre minimum that's required by the municipal code. So they do both meet the municipal code standards um, for the RMF zoning district. And then staff has added a condition because the rear lot will be, um, or the access will be shared over both parcels. Staff has added a condition that there's a document to record this shared access. Um, however, the map also does include a blanket private access sewer, water, utility, and drainage easements that covers all of the lot except for the portions of the building. So that'll ensure that the, even though it'll be two lots, it will share the um, parking and utilities as if it were kind of it will function as one development, is what I'm trying to say. The zoning allows for a maximum of 46 units on this uh, new rear parcel. The um, multifamily projects over 12 units require a conditional use permit, which is why this is coming before the um, 
the Planning Commission tonight. The project is 100% affordable, so it qualifies for an 80% density bonus. Um, the Since the project is 100% for affordable, it can also request up to four concessions to um, or exceptions to our municipal code standards. If there are other standards that physically interfere with the development, additional development modifications can be requested through the waiver process, which they have um, requested some waivers um, or concessions. They can kind of be considered both in this case. All new units will require a new, or I'm sorry, all units on the property will require a new 55 year affordable deed restriction. Um, and this adds a total of 76 units to the low income housing stock for the city. So to go over the des uh, site design of parcel to the new development, we can see um, the new building is sort of a U shape centered around this courtyard in the middle. And then parking is located around or on both sides of the building. And then there's a, a paved area for vehicle access to go around the building. And then I just wanted to highlight the trash enclosures since um, that will be a point later in the presentation. So this is the, the general design of the, um, of the new development on parcel two. So the applicant is requesting the following waivers and increase to the height that's allowed for the building. Um, they're requesting a 39 foot eight inch height where our municipal code that was actually just updated a few months ago allows for a maximum of 35 feet. However, um, the municipal code requires portions of the building over 25 feet to have additional setbacks. So this is a little bit over that 35 feet and then it doesn't have those required additional setbacks. So that's one of the waivers being requested. Um, they are also requesting a, redu a reduction in the required common open space from 22,000 square feet on parcel two to uh, around 9,000 square feet. So this is a, a pretty dramatic reduction and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then they're also requesting a reduction in required landscape for parcel two from 25%, that's required by the municipal code to 18%. The new building is designed to be consistent with the existing building. Um, the colors are a little bit different, but the, um, here we can see the renderings here. The colors are a little bit different, but they are kind of these warm, tones, which will complement the existing building. Um, here we can see the color and materials board. It includes board and batten siding, as well as horizontal siding on the front there. Um, and then that bottom uh, henna color is a, stucco, uh, is a stucco finish. So it will have a mix of materials and colors to add a little bit of architectural interest to the building. And here we can see um, the top picture is the front. And then there's one of the sides. That's the interior courtyard, that top picture. And then we have the other side there. And here are just a couple more images of that. So staff's recommendations. Um, we still do, the design review committee brought up some concerns about the massing and kind of the repetitive nature of the building. Um, there is a little bit of distinction, um, you know, with some of the portions being a little bit more offset than others, but we're still a little bit concerned about the overall massing and lack of more architectural features. So um, we, we did, add a condition and we would like to talk to the planning commission about adding new balconies to the um, exterior of the site, both on the outside and then also potentially within the courtyard area just to not only increase the architectural value, but also increase the outdoor areas for residents to kind of enjoy. Um, and then also in addition to this, or perhaps instead of this, we can talk about adding awnings to the, um, over these windows to kind of break up the repetitive nature of the windows and add a little bit more interest to the design. So again, we've added these conditions or 
this condition and we would like to talk to the planning commission about it. Next is um, about parking on the site. The existing parking lot has 122 parking spaces and the applicant is proposing to add 29 for a total of 151 parking spaces. These would be shared between both of the buildings um, for that are um, a total of 171 units. So we can see that there's fewer parking spaces than there actually are units. Um, there is a little bit of parking on El Camino Real, but especially this new building is pretty far set off. So that uh, it even the street parking doesn't add a lot of uh, additional parking to the site. Here are just some typical parking numbers. Um, again, the total proposed units is 171. Our code would normally require 264. Per the state density bonus, um, they would be required to have 185 and they're proposing 151. Um, however, since this is a, an affordable senior development, the state density bonus law does limit the municipality's ability to require on-site parking when developments are specifically created for individuals who are over 62 years old. Um, when the development is within one half mile to a fixed bus route or um, or has something like a, a ride share, which we do within the city of Atascadero. So per this, um, per this state density bonus law, the planning commission's ability to and staff's ability to actually require more parking is limited, um, which we did talk about. So I'm sorry to back up a little bit just to talk about the access that is available. The development is within a half mile to the nearest uh, regional transit stop, which operates more than eight times per day on weekdays, but it is a little bit less on weekends. And then Tascadero again does have a dial -a ride service, um, but the site is more than one mile away from any grocery store or pharmacy. So to go back, the design review committee expressed concerns over the reduced parking and requested a parking management plan, which would basically just require the applicant to um, provide some measures that would be provided if uh, you know parking did become an issue or to increase accessibility for current and new residents. Um, but at this point, we haven't received that parking management plan, so staff has actually added a condition regarding that, which I'll explain in just a minute. Um, the applicant did, did perform an independent parking study based on observations, and it is a fairly small study, just over a few weekdays and then the weekend. But it does show that at any one time, almost half of those 122 existing parking spaces are being used. So it is um, currently, it does appear to be uh, pretty overparked or underutilized. So based on that, um, there doesn't appear to be a huge concern over parking, um, but staff has added a condition to make sure that parking doesn't become an issue. And then again, to provide more access for uh, the residents to things like the grocery stores and services that they might need. So with the building permit, um, we would like to see this parking management plan completed. And this should include things like on-site van pools with daily trips to grocery and retail stores, um, perhaps a car share vehicle for the tenants to actually rent for tenants who don't have a vehicle. Um, designated parking spaces for visitors and employees to make sure that the um, that the residents there, their visitors can find parking and that it's not an issue for employees. Um, and then any other similar programs that increase the mobility for the seniors to nearby services. And here's just showing where those new 29 parking spaces will be uh, created around the new building. Moving on to landscaping, um, approximately 18% of parcel two will be landscaped, which is below the 25% that's required, required by the municipal code. 
Um, the municipal code also requires a minimum of 10% of parking areas to be landscape and shade trees to be provided, which they do um, meet this requirement. But the applicant is requesting a concession to reduce the minimum landscaped area from 25 to 18%. Um, and so that's one of those three concessions that they're requesting. And here we can just see the parking management plan. Most of the new trees are focused around the rear portion of the site because they are going to have to take out a few native oak trees around there. Um, and then at the design review committee, we did discuss making the parking spaces a, a, a foot shorter and then increasing the width of the landscape planter around the parking lot. And they were able to do that, um, which increased the landscaping a little bit. And then you can see throughout the courtyard there, it's landscaped with various trees and vegetation. And talking about the courtyard, we can see their specific courtyard here. It includes things like picnic tables, a small lawn with a sundial in the middle, um, some benches for the residents to utilize, um, and then just some different garden art and garden features to um, add a little bit more interest to the courtyard and just some more things for the residents to enjoy. And then there's also an entry arbor in the back there coming off of the driveway. And just to go over the trash enclosure a little bit, the design review committee, the um, plan wasn't exactly nailed down at that time, but the design review committee did make it clear that they wanted to see something more decorative and less industrial. So this is just a, a kind of a sketch of what it would be. Um, but the but staff has added a condition that the design of the trash enclosure be approved uh, to the satisfaction of the community development department with this in mind um, during the building permit process. And there are two trash enclosures on the site. So next going over the tree removals, um, there are 15 native trees that are proposed for removal, ranging from 11 inches in diameter to 50 inches in diameter. Um, in looking at the arborist report, it is pretty clear that the um, trees are within the area of development or grading will impact the tree significantly to where it will be um, basically unstable and could become a hazard because of how close the roots are cut and um, and how it will destabilize the tree. So they are taking out 15 trees, um, but they are planting, replanting quite a few with their landscape plan. So going over the, the multifamily standards, um, there are 100 cubic feet of enclosed storage required per unit. There's 2,800, 28,500 square feet of open space required for parcel one and 22,800 square feet of open space required for parcel two. Um, this can be provided in one shared location, provided that no area is less than 1,000 square feet. So, um, so the courtyard would be counted for both of those parcels. The applicant does provide the designated storage required. Um, Parcel two is under the required amount of open space, as we'd mentioned earlier. The applicant did provide four new shared balconies. I was hoping I'll show you um, a rendering of that in just a little bit, but they did provide four new shared balconies that face the inner courtyard on the second and third floors providing 420 square feet of outdoor space. So this isn't technically counted as open space, but it did, um, but they did try to add a little bit more outdoor space based on the design review committee's recommendations. And then parcel one will also be below the open space requirement since um, a lot of their open space on what's going to be parcel two will be taken up by I think your mic units. Up. Yeah, you, you froze up there on us for a moment. Did I, am, I, am I back? You're back now. Okay. At least you didn't have a bad look on your face. 
<laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Okay. So um, staff added a condition again that goes back to adding balconies or some sort of outdoor patio to increase this open space area for residents. Um, not only, as I'd mentioned before, would it increase the architectural value, but it would also potentially um, increase the just general enjoyment for the residents there to have a little bit more outdoor space. So whether these balconies are um, on the upper floors or if there are some patios toward the inner courtyard, um, just potentially some more outdoor space for residents to enjoy. So that's something we would like to talk to the Planning Commission about as well. I do want to just put a reminder out there about the Housing Accountability Act. Um, this does establish limitations on local government's ability to deny, reduce the density of, or basically make infeasible housing developments that are consistent with objective uh, development standards when they're affordable, such as this one. So in, that, in this case, the Planning Commission can't condition this project in such a way that would make it challenging for the applicants to build the desired number of units that's allowed by the density bonus. So, um, so we, the um, staff has recommended conditions and the Planning Commission can uh, approve or add conditions, but not if they reduce the density or make the project infeasible at the density that they're requesting. Exactly. Do you mind if I add to that just for a second too, Mariah? On that sure, one? go ahead. Um, and I think that's a tough one to interpret, but really the way we've interpreted locally is we do have discretion on architecture in so much as the architectural comments we make don't impact the density of the project or the ability for it to be carried forward with that density. So when we talk about things like awnings or small patios on some of these, uh, some of these units, those are architectural features. Those are standards that we would have as objective standards if we had objective standards developed, which we are developing. Um, those are the kind of things that we feel that we do have the discretion on, but whereas if you said, hey, the building's too tall, or you know you, you need to have a greater setback or add a lot more ground floor open space and that reduce the size of the building then that's going to impact the number of units and density which is going to be inconsistent with that housing accountability act so that's kind of where we put the mindset there it's a bit of a gray area it's a bit of a challenge and i think the applicant will want to weigh in on that as well in terms of what we can and can't do in terms of our discretion. But the comments that I think that Mariah made on this project are, are also comments that came from the design review committee that we're carrying forward to the planning commission. Yes, thank you, Phil, for the clarification. Um, and just moving forward, uh, here are some of the, or here are the three floor plans um, for each of the floors. This is the first floor with a total of 24 units. And it includes this community space that opens directly to the courtyard here. Um, the second floor is similar with some additional units in this area instead of that community room. And then the third floor is similar as well. Um, and then, oh, I was hoping to get to the renderings, which would show um, these balconies to the outdoor space, but I'm not sure. Maybe I skipped over them, um, but these areas over here are the ones that are open to the outdoor um, and have a little tiny um, balcony for residents to use and it's a shared space over that courtyard. Here are just some photos from the site. Um, this top one is looking from uh, what's now the existing driveway back onto the site. This is about the location of the new building. Um, the bottom picture there is the view kind of looking from the area of the new building at the old building. This front picture is just a view of the current building from El Camino Real. And then the bottom picture is as well. You can see a little bit more. You can see um, the new building will be located pretty far back there on this picture. It's even hard to see exactly where it will be located um, because it's pretty far back off of 
El Camino Real. Um, the conditions of approval are all included in your staff report. Um, I think the applicant will probably want to pull a couple specifically, so we can talk about those or if the Planning Commission has any questions about any of them. Um, the project qualifies for a class two categorical exemption for construction of an infill development. Staff's recommendation is that the Planning Commission adopt the draft resolution approving the conditional use permit for a 76 unit affordable senior housing apartment building, as well as a subdivision map to split the lot at 10165 El Camino into two parcels, subject to findings and conditions of approval. The alternatives are that the Planning Commission can include modifications to the project um, for approval. The Planning Commission can determine that more information is needed and refer the item back to staff or the Commission may deny the project. And staff is available for questions. All right. I see that uh, Dennis has his hand raised. I'll go to Dennis first. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mariah, thank you for your, your presentation. Um, you, at the very beginning um, and through the, the presentation, talked about the Housing Accountability Act and the state density bonus law and the allowances for concessions or waivers within those two uh, documents. Um, is there anything that says when it comes to a waiver, is there a, a uh, any direction that says that a, a waiver can't reduce an amount by fifty percent or twenty five percent or any any type of qualified number in terms of uh, a concession or a waiver? So, you understand uh, what I'm saying or trying to say? So. I guess going over waivers, um, a waiver would be a request to do something. Let's, for example, say the height. Um, they're requesting a waiver to the height because without adding additional height, they wouldn't be able to meet the density allowed by the state density bonus, um, which they're actually even below at this point. But our code limits their ability to get to that density and therefore they can request a waiver. Um, does that answer your question? I'm more saying, asking is, um, let's use parking as an example where the our code says a certain amount, they're re requesting a concession or again, or a waiver. I don't know if there's a distinguishing uh, definition between the two. But uh, let's say they request a 25% uh, reduc reduction in parking. Um, is there something within the, the acts that, uh, that, and the laws that allow for concessions uh, that says you can only reduce, uh, let's say, parking by 10%? I mean, is there any type of threshold within the laws that say, uh, you've gone too far or, you, I mean, is there a limit on mm -hmm. how much can be asked for besides the four? Mm -hmm. Does that make, am I making sense? <laughs> yes, yes. And maybe Phil can weigh in on this, but I don't think there's any kind of limit. I think it's just um, how, you know, in no. order to reasonably yeah. meet their density, um, there's not specific thresholds. There's thresholds of density. So if they provide certain amounts of affordability and density, they're, they're eligible for additional waivers and additional concessions. But in those waivers, there's no threshold about what those levels are. That's really a negotiation and discretion factor uh, from the city um, in terms of those levels. So um, that's where we have to look at things like health and safety and are these things really being done um, to make the number of units fit or are they being done to save the developer money or what's where are they at so you know that's really it so the threshold becomes really how can you maximize the density on this site 
maximize the floor area of these units really up to the number of units um, by using these waivers and concessions. That's what they're for. They're, they're specifically for fitting the units on the property. So if you think of it in that effect, they're not for, hey, let's make this property look lower quality or look less architecturally nice. Um, that's not what we want. And that's not what these waivers or concessions are for. Therefore, purely a size. And parking takes up a lot of space. Open space areas on the site take up a lot of space. Those things reduce the density. And so those are logical things to go after. Um, but there's no actual thresholds. OK. If the commission were to consider either, um, let's say, not granting a concession, are there special findings that need to be made to uh, to deny a concession? There are, um, I can find those. I think they would be pretty difficult. Um, I think they're based off of objective standards, which I don't believe would apply in this case, um, but I can go ahead and pull those up and and let you know exactly what those would be. Um, the parking technically is not actually really a concession or a waiver because it is serving a senior population and per the state law, um, it reads that if you're serving this population over 62 years old, you actually don't have any required parking. Um, so, so they are technically meeting the state's requirement in that. Um, and that's why we're asking for these additional measures just to make sure in addition to the reduced parking that the um, mobility of the seniors is, uh, you know, still good and that parking won't become an issue in the future because um, we can add conditions like that. Mm -hmm. So 62 years of age is senior. Um, um, there was a letter from the Bike Coalition uh, of San Luis Obispo County talking about um, the avail availability of adding uh, possible bike facilities within the project. Um, I'm 66 years old, I ride my bike, uh, just to let people know. Um, and so th with respect to the parking management plan, could, uh, facilities for bike storage or uh, uh, lockers or uh, parking areas be uh, be considered part of the parking management plan. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask a quick question? So I'm looking up on the state's website under what qualifies as seniors. And while 62 is the standard age, it does mention that 55 years of age or older and a senior citizen housing development does count as well. So is this project, I just want to clarify, is it specifically 62 and up or does 55 qualify as well? So this would actually be uh, restricted to 55 and up. So it's a senior as in 55 and up, but it does serve that 62 and up population. So that's why it's all. Okay. Rolled. Yeah, because I mean, the average uh, median requirement age, uh, retirement age is right around 62, 63 years old. And we are dealing with um, low income here. So I want to be aware and make sure that I bring that up. Um, I do also want to ask currently, um, and I don't know if I misheard this, it's possible. Um, the parking currently, are, is there any over parking issues right now? Like, are they having people having to park on the street with 30 plus units already or I mean, 30 plus spaces? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't appear that way. The applicant yeah. did provide that small parking study. Um, and so based on that information and staff's observations, we've been out there multiple times throughout different parts of the day. And it does look like about half to two thirds is being taken up at this time. Okay, okay. Um, and then they did mention that they had a uh, landscaping plan as far as I was gonna deal with uh, tree replacement. Um, do they have a ratio as far as like, are they doing like one to one, like if they're cutting down a tree, are they replacing it with one or is it, you know, less one to two? Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily a ratio. Um, it's just their, their plan does include a lot of large uh, native trees. So that 
it kind of is without us telling them they have to do it, their tree planting is actually mitigating their tree removals. Okay, okay. Um, and then lastly, as far as for just public safety element, I do just wanna bring up, if we do pass this and they end up at 100%, you know, one-to-one -one ratio for vehicle per unit, um, if you have the extra 20 plus cars parking out on the roadway, does the city have any discretion as far as whether that is going to cause any traffic issues or any uh, public safety access issues? So that's kind of part of the idea of the parking management plan. And while it's not an issue now um, to, to say how it's going to fix an issue if there's one in the future. So whether that's assigning each, uh, you know, 155 units parking spaces or, um, you know, limiting the number of parking spaces per unit so that when someone um, rents here and they have a car, they, they can know if they do or don't have a parking space. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I know I'm asking a lot of questions here. I just want to make sure that I properly advocate for, you know, seniors in this situation, because if, if, if it is uh, applying to 55 and above, and people aren't able to an average retire for another seven years. We are a commute um, town. Most people commute for their jobs. Um, I don't wanna necessarily limit someone just because one, they're elderly or they're in low-income housing to have a glass ceiling of now you can't have a vehicle because that can also limit their ability for profession and whatnot. So I just, I'm trying to kind of make sure. So it looks like if the public um, parking off the front becomes a problem, there is a contingency plan in place that is to address that, that they'll have to make some compensation. Mm -hmm. That's what the condition is for, because this property, like a yeah. lot of these properties are challenged by the fact that they're along an arterial road and parking is very, very scarce and limited on El Camino Real. Yeah. And it's not a nice place to park or a safe place to park. It's not yeah. a pedestrian environment and um, it's not a residential street for necessarily. So yeah, my, uh, my Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, just, you know, my natural concern is, I mean, if you're having a bunch of people who are elderly, you haven't go out to a main roadway like that. I mean, God forbid, you know, someone gets swiped or whatnot. It can be, I mean, I've worked construction on El Camino and I've had plenty of cars run through my cone zone. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is something that I'm just trying to yeah. balance out. Um, yeah. On this one, since they are asking for a concession as far as for minimalizing uh, their landscaping, is there any way for us to be able to suggest maybe see if they can fit a little bit of extra parking um, with it, or is it all pretty much set in stone how our plans are right now? It's pretty tight on this site to really get more yeah. parking out of that. Um, the landscape screening is very important because you're surrounded on two or three sides of the back of this site by yeah. um, a single family mobile home park where, um, you know, a lot of their those properties look across at this property and this is their view shed. And so the landscaping is really critical in really helping this project blend in. And so if we provide more parking, it's gonna be more stark there. And, and um, there's not room at the back of the site to do the parking because you need 16 foot deep parking space plus 24 foot of backup space. So at the end, it's a 40 foot depth you need. You don't have the space to do it without moving the site plan around and uh, either making the unit smaller or making a smaller unit count. Okay, and one last thing, we if we do pass this, we are splitting the lots, right? So does that open any potential issues in the future? Like let's say one person buys the back lot and then they try to file for, hey, I, you know, I need an easement right away because we are using these um, collective access, you know, we need access to this roadway, like any eminent domain issues? The map requires all the easements to be recorded with it. So those are all covered with the map. So utility easements, access easements, all of those things have to happen with this kind of a map. Okay, yeah, so it pretty much looks like how everything's set up, if they did have issues with parking in the future, it is, there is a contingency in place that they would have to address it. That's the idea of the parking management plan is to help mitigate potential issues. And they, we're not asking them to be mitigated by adding more parking, we're just saying, hey, if you can provide a van pool, if you can provide bicycle parking, if you can, you know, guarantee that you're only going to have so many people that own cars, all these kinds of things go into a parking yeah. management plan to show that it's mitigated and properly addressed. 
And, uh, you know, there's many of these types of projects that were throughout our county that have provided those kinds of plans. And it's really helped offset the need to actually supply the parking They actually work, so. Okay, so there's a precedent already that's been in use. That, that was my oh, yeah. next question. Thank you so much everyone for being patient. Sorry about asking all those questions. Mm -hmm. Good questions. Any other questions uh, by our commissioners? Uh, yeah, real, real quick, I'm happy Randy asked all those questions. They were very uh, uh, right along the lines of what I was going to ask. Um, <clears throat> I don't see any uh, uh, community center or anything like that for, for people to get out of their apartment and into a community area when the weather's not wonderful. Um, so California Manor doesn't have anything. Um, what I, my question is basically the intent of this, this structure is to, is to house people who are seniors who probably don't uh, get out a lot, but I worry about the ability for them to, 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 to get out to, to places to uh, eat, to um, you know, maybe the park or something like that, and taking a bus a mile and a half is kind of difficult sometimes. Um, how does this fit into the general plan for, for that type of density in this particular area? Mm -hmm. Well, this is this is zone multifamily, and you're right. It, it is, this effectively, this location is in what we call a food desert. It's a very long walk to the nearest restaurants and stores, and, and um, that's why part of this parking management plan, we're saying, hey, there should be a van pool um, in addition to the city transit that can effectively take the people that distance. Um, when we look at the future general plan, we need to think about these things. When these areas were zoned as multifamily, they were really designed a little bit too far detached for my liking from the areas that have the restaurants and the stores. Um, but that's what the zoning is today on the general plan. They are pushing the density a little further than we had anticipated for this location. Um, but that is, that's part and parcel to our current general plan right now. Um, another real quick question. Is there any uh, lots in the area that are uh, maybe slated for future um, you know, community type businesses or, or anything like that? Restaurants or shopping? Or... I know in the area there's some, some everything's pretty much taken up. The, uh, there's no big plan centers near this at all. Uh, there's no properties that could really accommodate that. The nearest thing to this particular property for example, would be the Chalk Mountain Liquor Store or the, the plaza, the, the Hawkins Plaza that's across from that. Um, and that's already fully developed and built out. Um, on the south end of town, there is a five acre commercial property at Dove Creek. But again, that's a pretty great distance from here. And there's nothing else that's planned um, until you get, you know, to that Dove Creek parcel or all the way up towards where the Food for Less and Smart and Final shopping centers are uh, currently or um, where the um, guest house grill is at that particular location. Okay, so it's, it's basically this, these units are going to have to fit a particular uh, lifestyle that is, is uh... Uh, it's, fairly, it's fairly isolated, yeah. And so they're going to have to rely on food delivery services and a van pool or the dial a ride or transit to really have that connection. It's not, this is not a walkable community location. Um, so from that bigger perspective, those are really good topics to discuss. Right. Suprema Meat Store has a market inside of it too. Yes, yes, it does. Um, at the, um, that's right, that's not very far away from this location. The old foster freeze. Yeah, that's a neat, uh, that's a neat new market. So Jason, also there is a, a community room shown on the plans, just so you are aware of that. Yeah, there is a community room here. This is the first floor. Um, I believe it has a little shared kitchen for the residents to use. Um, and then there are some additional activity rooms. So there are um, a few new spaces for residents to utilize, you know, let's say if it were raining. So there are some shared spaces. All right, I didn't see it, thank you. Any other questions from staff? Tori, did you have any questions? 
Um, just kind of a comment. I really like the idea of a balcony space, especially over the courtyard. I think that that would sort of encourage, um, you know, a community there where people could sit out on their balconies and talk with passersby and things like that. Um, so I, I would, I definitely think that that should be included in the plan. Um, I don't know logistically how that would work, how much expense or anything that would add to it, but I think that that would be a really cool design feature um, to add. Um, I also think the parking management plan just, you know, besides the fact of the parking issue, I think because of the um, audience of who these apartments are zoned for or going for, um, the, the pools, the access to buses, all of that is really, really important to make sure that these senior citizens um, can get out of this area, um, not just to the grocery store, but to any other activities that are happening in town because we don't want to exclude them. So I think that those are all um, really important things to make sure that even though they're isolated where they live, they could still be part of the community at large. So I think that those are important things to include. May I ask one question? Um, Tori actually brought up a really good point there as far as them having access to ride services and whatnot. Um, is there any dedicated area, like as far as if they have like ride on service coming in, um, in their parking area, or is it all kind of going to be more just off the frontage uh, road of El Camino? So that's not something they have shown right now because this is something we're adding as a condition. Um, okay. But if that's, you know, if the planning commission wants to see that specifically outlined, that's something that we could add to the condition. Yeah, my, my concern is just like if it's like way out of the way. I mean, the if, depending on who you're dealing with, some people might not be able to, to make it because um, they might need more involved care. Um, I just, just pure curiosity, Tori, just said something in my little light bulb went off in my head there <laughs> yeah when I was there there was actually a ride share um van picking some people up and they just parked right on the side of the building because they were only there for a few minutes okay um, wasn't there I, I, from the de design review committee wasn't there an area out front uh, you know, between, let's say, the two projects in which there was dedicated for, at least I thought it was a wider area for potential pickup by people, or by vans or, so uh, kind of like midway between the two trash enclosures. Uh, I don't, oh, maybe there is a loading zone. It does, it does say loading there. Yeah, yeah, so there actually is a loading area right there in the middle. Is there, uh, um, I, I don't know, I'm trying to, I don't know the right words. There was a discussion about having people uh, who live here be involved and get out, not be isolated. Uh, is there going to be some type of management uh, uh, group in which there might be a, uh, uh, a person who organizes events or something that, are, or that brings uh, things to the residents about what they can do and where they can go or have planned activities? We have a, and we're going to play games on Friday night or something like that. Is that part of this project? Um, it is not currently part of the project. It might be good for the applicant to weigh in. Um, they might have something like that already, but that would probably be a good discussion to have. Jason? Okay, um, we were talking about putting balconies on the second, third floor. Um, I, I don't know the name of them, but they're almost like a ground floor balcony. They're still a little outdoor area. Would that be possible as well? Just because the balconies above are going to be covered, it'd be nice to have a ground floor outdoor sitting area for you know each unit that's that's accessible. The patio. In fact, that's what we were yeah. suggesting as staff is if some of those ground floor units could have access to that courtyard from that ground floor, even if it wasn't a patio, but if they had a door to go out to. 
right now all these units are accessed from a dark interior corridor and they have windows and that's it. Yeah. If only they had a way to get out to that courtyard and have that interaction. And if some of those second floor units had a simple balcony that covered that area, that's exactly what we're talking about. It's a significant architectural feature. It's a significant um, sort of social interaction tool here that really helps. I think uh, the applicant is concerned about doing those things from a liability standpoint or from an appearance standpoint. I think they'll weigh in on that, but um, I think it's staff's opinion that those would be very significant quality attributes to this project where you've got a lot of you know really closed door interior spaces. I know I, know I lived in, a, in an apartment complex that had those and it was night and day. It was really, really nice to just sit out there and you know watch uh, watch the community while you sip your coffee. It was uh, exactly. past your house. It was very, very nice. Got you outside, made you feel a little bit more uh, less isolated. So yep. very important. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there's no other uh, comments, we'll go ahead and open it up open up the public hearing and invite the applicant to address us. Scott, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Great, all right. Yes, my name is Scott Mercer. I'm the project architect. And um, first of all, thank you. Um, both, thank you, Mariah, um, especially for your uh, all your hard work on this, and Phil as well for his input. Um, I'd like to thank the commission for uh, giving me a chance to you know address some of the concerns and uh, and hopefully uh, clarify a couple of things. Um, first of all, I wanted to start by giving a little background on the project design it's, itself, in that um, we we started by you know looking at the existing building on on site. Um, Design-wise, and our, our goal was to be, you know, compatible in configuration and amenities to what was already there. Um, so it was, you know, a courtyard building. The existing one is a courtyard building with interior corridors. Um, you know, stucco and siding, as Mariah pointed out. Um, there aren't, you know, private exterior access um, for the apartment units. Um, we, however, decided that we did want to impr improve on a few things. Um, for example, we believe that our courtyard is upgraded in amenities and design above what is existing in the other existing, you know, building on the site. Um, and we also have nine foot ceilings throughout um, our project in the units. Um, we felt that that was important. It does get, you know, more light in with from the fairly large windows that we have in there and such. Um, I wanted to just address a couple of things before um, I get to the balcony um, issue. Um, a lot of the other members of the uh, commission did a, a good job of noticing some of the concerns of other of members, so I appreciate that. For example, the loading zone in front of, of, of the building right in the middle, yeah, there was a very sizable loading zone with the intent of being able to have a safe, close place for park and ride um, to come in. Um, as well as if there was, you know, a carpool type, you know, situation, for example, um, that was, I was on purpose because of the issues that had been pointed out. We noticed those. Um, as far as activities go, I wanted to mention that is that we don't have, you know, exact activity plan. This is just still CUP level um, in the senior projects that I've been involved with um, in the past. There always have been some levels of, of activities um, that have been planned and organized by, um, you know, by the management. That is a standard um, thing in these type of projects. And I, you know, again, I, I, we don't have an, uh, any kind of a plan for that precisely right now. But that is certainly a thing that is common amongst these type of of, of projects once they're you know once they're get going. Um, I also wanted to point out that, as was pointed out, as far as community spaces go. We have 500 square feet of those activity areas centrally located on the second and third floors, uh, which is a very sizable space, uh, as well as uh, almost a thousand square feet on the first floor of the community space that included that kitchen area as well. And the design review committee had wanted some increased um, 
what's the right word, uh, access, right, from the, from the ground floor space. So for example, we just had a pair of, initially we had a pair of uh, just a single, you know, double doors there. We added several, you know, others. So we have three sets of double doors to really, um, especially when the weather's good, you know, open those up. So it, it adds for easy access to the covered um, communal um, patio that's, that's adjacent to the first floor uh, community area that then is open. Uh, the idea being that it opens up and you have, you know, good views and easy access, you know, to the courtyard areas. Also, as is fairly easy to see from the site plan, um, so as to not be cluttered, this site plan obviously doesn't show all the landscaping that, that had been, you know, that is planned for the project, but from both sides, um, there are access, you know, aisles from the midpoints in each of the, you know, the, the, the U-shaped, um, you know, wings, right? That access from the first floor that goes out to, um, you know, the middle of, of that, um, of, the, of the courtyard. Um, just really quickly with regards to the, the, the parking, you know, we hear the uh, concerns about parking as has been pointed out that approximately two thirds of the parking, kind of the maximum that's being utilized at any given time of the existing project is about two thirds of the parking spaces. It's usually you know, between, between a half and two thirds. And given the parking totals after this project is built, we, you know, we are still well above that two thirds um, or one half you know, thresholds. We, we don't think there's gonna be a problem with that. The state law actually says that the municipality can't require that we have additional s studies um, for the parking and such, but it's in the best interest for the for all parties that we have enough parking, and we have no problem with, you know, having a a type of a, a plan to the level that um, Phil had Phil and I had spoken of uh, as well as um, previously that it's not a a, a huge, well, you know super detailed thing, but it just, it's some general um, potential, you know, things that could be done to, uh, to address any parking issues. Again, we don't foresee that there's gonna be an issue, um, but um, again, we, 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 we're willing to work, you know, with the, with the, the city on, on some of those issues, just to make sure that everybody is, you know, at ease with regards to that. Um, and the last thing that I want to just mention is that, you know, there are 27 conditions in the staff report. And basically, we don't have any issues with at all with about 25 of those. We're, we, we think that the, the, the staff did an excellent job of, of incorporating some of the concerns from the design review committee. And we are, you know, we are willing uh, to go along with, like I said, about 25 of those, 25 and a half even. Um, we do have... Two of the conditions that are, are a concern for us. I know that everybody loves the idea of, of the balconies. I love balconies. And if we had you know, additional public space, community space to, that we didn't have to worry about infringing on you know, with a bunch of balconies, then you know, we might head that direction. But also um, balconies, tend to collect unsightly clutter and they're hard to maintain. And like I said, any balconies or patios that we add on here really take a pretty big bite out of the, the common corridor space. What we're trying to do is, is you know, make spaces that, that were as, as big, you know, we're trying to consolidate the, the open space and the community space so that people can go and and have you know the best experience possible there, um, and so I'm going to just address one final thing, and it's really kind of a clincher with regards to the the balcony issue, and that is that <clears throat> if we have too many differences between the existing and the new parts of the project, um, frankly, the the investors and lenders of California Matter One, the existing project they have to agree to release the property, meaning that they have to approve of a lot split and the sale of the piece of property that's gonna to go to create California Manor 2. Um, if California Manor 2 has 
literally you know, too many amenities and advantages over California Manor One, and then that actually threatens um, the, the, that new project, those amenities actually threaten the investments in the existing project. Um, if, if that's the case, then they don't have an incentive to allow the other project to move forward. So as part of our design program was to try to match fairly equally because you know, imagine if you had, you know, if, if you own the, the first project and if, if you agree to, to sell off to a separate, you know, a different investment group and developer or you know, to, to create this other project and it's all, you know, low, low income housing and it's all on the same site, all the things being equal, you know, the rents are probably going to be basically the same given the way that low income housing works and everything. But if it's way better than what your project is on the front and and then what, you know, what's going to stop everybody to rush into the back part that's, you know, a whole lot nicer. I know that sounds kind of um, ruthlessly pragmatic, but that's the truth uh, of the situation is that we make this one in the back too fancy, then the, the people who own the part, you know, the, the owners of the front part, the existing parcel, you know, they're, they don't have an incentive to, to you know, to, to do this, to get rid of the back part and then have literally every everybody who wants to come to this area to, to fill up the back at, at risk of having vacancies in the front. And again, I, I love I love the idea of, of, of balconies and such. I, I've proposed that um, as, as is shown in condition number 23, where it's a little more general, where it talks about additional features that could include awnings um, and, and such and balconies, whatever, we, we are open to working with uh, the city on, on the adding, especially maybe some, you know, rigid shade, shade, shade structure awnings, things that, that can break up that vertical, um, you know, the vertical faces of the, of the building a little more, make, you know, increase some, some attractiveness there. That's, you know, we're totally open to that. But like I said, we would ask for the reasons that I've listed to, um, get rid of you know the balconies in condition 23 and completely strike condition 24. Um, and again, those are the you know the arguments that we have and we believe that they are, like I said, those it's not just a, a, a random, oh, we don't want to put up balconies. But again, if there are you know amenities that are too they overshadow the amenities in the front part of the, the project, then it, it literally can can threaten the in, entire feasibility of the project. So thank you very much. I appreciate the, the opportunity to address these issues. Thank you, Scott. Uh, any commissioners have questions for Scott? Dennis? Yeah, I'm a little surprised. So there's no agreement in place between, uh, I mean, Manor 2 is being done with the potential that it could never be successful. Uh, and so there's no agreement that's in place at this point that says that this is going to go forward. Uh, I, I don't understand the I don't understand the question. Well, you suggested that the uh, that there the feasibility of unit two might not happen if the if there's too many uh, if it's a lot different than phase one. And so my question is, is that there isn't an agreement in place at this point that says that phase two uh, is going to continue uh, despite there being more balconies or more, you know, architectural features. I, I'm confused by that, that uh, it, it almost makes it sound like that phase two is being uh, proposed as we're going through and there's no agreement between uh, on the property right now to create phase two. Uh, uh, the, the, the ownership of phase one has been presented and they have agreed to the idea of doing this. The problem is, is that, you know, you, you can't have a, a, a development ag agreement that is involving a lot of details. If those details haven't been worked out, for example, we don't have a, a CUP um, a, a approved yet. We even after that happens, what has to happen is um, other you know other invest, investors have to sign sign on board. Then we because this will be a low income housing tax credit project, we will 
be applying for those tax credits. Um, there are a lot of things that have to happen and, and, and line up right for the pro for the project to you know to to proceed. Um, um, and as as those as everything lines up and is approved incrementally, uh, which is the standard way that this kind of thing happens, then the the details get banged out between um, the ownership of the existing parcel and the new ownership group of of the second. And and so, you know, we're trying to put in place a, a project that has the most likely chance of of being approved from you know from the city's perspective, from the the, the, the tax state tax credits, from um, all, all of the different players, um, and so you know we try to juggle and balance all of these things out. And if we see that there's going to be a, a, an aspect to a project that is going to potentially you know threaten the way the project goes through, you know we're, we're trying to take all of these you know it's more than like a parametric kind of situation. There. Are, dozens and dozens and almost infinite numbers of 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 things that can happen on, on, on a project that can as far as part of the design or part of you know the, the 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 process and so in in balancing out all of those things our experience is showing us that that uh, you know once you know therefore we're, one of the goals is to have it be comparable in many respects to what is on the front part of the property and I, I think that that um, I don't know what else to say about it. That's that makes sense to me. Um, I, I hope I explained that. Maybe I didn't do a great job. <laughs> Thank you. I have a Thank question. Um, so, is there any form of agreement between these two properties that their rent expectation is going to be the same across the board? Is there anything locking in place? No, we don't have my. We don't have. I do not believe that there is any kind of language like that, for saying that it's you know restricted in a specific way. Like I'm saying, okay. I, you know, because I'm, I'm trying, I'm, things are, every, everything's in flux until things get, you know, completely banged out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, 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 res I respect what you're bringing up as far as you don't want to um, disincentivize people who are investing in this. Um, so for what I understand and correct me if, I, if I'm wrong on any of this, um, this is 80%, right? So essentially it is for low income, very low income in particular and elderly. Um, yeah. So whoever's managing this project, running it, owning it, um, essentially they're expected to only pay the twenty percent. Is that correct, or is it eighty um, percent? I, I I am. I don't have exact answer. You know, my as okay. as the project architect, I I'm I'm not sure exactly how that works. Okay, yeah, I I'm trying to just understand the process because I know um, usually HUD comes through. HUD has a voucher. And the person is made whole in a way as far as what the uh, market value expectation is. So it doesn't hurt the consumer. Um, I just wanted to, you know, if if the back does get developed nicer and the people in the front are paying yeah. the same, I, I see where your argument is valid that people are like, hey, I want to have these nicer amenities. And you can have a little bit of a struggle. But also, if the expectation is that HUD and the taxpayer is compensating and making the uh, whoever's managing or owning whole, um, I also want to give them the best that I can, you know, just from advocating for the population that you're going to be serving. Um, so, so thank you for coming on. I, I know this is like a tricky project, so thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Scott? Okay. Um, Annette, we received a couple of letters. Can we have those read into the minutes? So can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so we uh, we don't actually need to read those into the record anymore because we post them on our website now. So oh, okay. the deadline for that was noon today, and um, I did post those on the website and emailed them to you as well. So those will be part of the record, and then anything that comes in after noon will uh, be, become part of the administrative record for this project. Okay. Thank you. That's, You're that's welcome. Good, good to know. Yeah. Okay, then we will open it up to the public for comments. If there are anybody on online on Zoom that would like to make a comment on this project, if you would please raise your hand. And if you're on the phone, if you would press star nine. Looks like we have Jerry, um, who I've allowed to speak. I think you just need to unmute. 
Yes, Jerry, if you want to unmute, you you can speak. Gotcha. Hi, you guys. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I guess my main question right now would be, if this project is a go, and I know there's a lot of things that, that can happen, but what is the earliest it would start and how long would the construction process take place? Uh, as you can see by the questions and concerns I submitted for the first meeting, the second meeting, and then my neighbor's additional comments. This is like a gut punch to us. I, I just have to tell you, <laughs> there's a few of us that were, were told when we bought our places that, you know, it's an open space and nobody could build and butt up right back to us. We understand that that, that is very seriously out of our control and we're kind of fighting a losing battle on that. But as you can see, a lot of the comments about the trees, the privacy, Scott says that he's going to be landscaping and replacing trees. Is that replacing really beautiful mature trees with five foot trees that take another 20 years to grow? Um, and again, aside from that, just really concerned about when this starts and how long we will have major construction literally right out our, our windows. Okay, thank you, Jerry. This is just a part for comments. We will respond to those as soon as public comment is over. Thank you. Am I able to ask uh, Jerry any question as far as like a rebuttal or just for extra information here? Sure. Yeah, sorry, Jerry. I just I just want to make sure that I understood stood you. So you mentioned that you guys had some form of guarantee that there wouldn't be development. Um, was that like uh, ever documented anywhere, like as far as in like your guys' right of rescission with your uh, mortgage? Or I, I, you mentioned you bought, so I don't know if like you're owning, renting here. I just want to clarify, one, are you um, renting or do you own? And then two, is there any way that that was ever documented as far as that you guys are given that guarantee? I own and I was told by the seller and her realtor that it was open space. I would have to go back and look at the MLS listing, but I believe on that it showed that there was open space behind this, but there was nothing in a contract um, that I could tie back to that. Okay. Yeah. And my main question on that is um, every, uh, any type of transaction with um, loans and whatnot, you have what's called right of rescission. And if you aren't given proper documentation on that right of rescission has been flipped where people have 20 years down the road brought something like that up and it has reversed situations where someone has gained a property and then also got all their money back. So I just wanted to make sure that if it's been documented in a way that one that we disclose it all here, so um, no, that's that's a good question. I actually paid paid cash outright, and in in all honesty, I know I paid a little bit extra because it was very important to me that I had open space and the beauty behind me. And you know we're elbow to elbow side by side here, but there's about a dozen of us that back up to this open space, and a lot of people just. Uh, just don't have it in them, I think, to fight the fight. So there's only a few of us that are that are engaging in this, and we are a very small minority. Uh, so we we kind of feel like we don't matter. But I think that's where where I'm having a hard time is I pretty much know I I paid a little bit extra just for that peace and serenity and beauty behind me. It was important. Okay, well, thank you for, for chiming in. Uh, I, I do appreciate you uh, making your voice heard on it. I just wanted to make sure that I accurately understood what you stated, and um, I do appreciate your public comments, so thank you. Yeah, good question. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, do we have any other people from the public who would like to speak? This is the time to do that. If you would raise your hand in Zoom. I'm not seeing anybody else with their hand raised at this time. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Okay, uh, we will go ahead and close the public hearing portion of the meeting. And uh, 
Bill and Mariah, could you address some of the comments that, that Jerry had? Um, I know you can't talk about really timing because that, it could take years before this is even starting. Um, but any comments on some of the questions that Jerry had? Yeah, I think the timing question is a good one for the applicant team um, based on you know when they get their financing together, when they get their construction <laughs> plans going. But what I can tell you is what's typical with a project like this, if they succeed with their um, entitlements here tonight, there is a little bit more of a process for an affordable housing project because they do have to go through that process um, with the, um, the financing. Um, and then they would develop construction drawings and submit those. A construction review process might take several months and, um, you know, it's possible if they rushed everything through that they could be developing this project um, next summer, um, you know, on a rapid end. I mean, it, it takes the city, you know, uh, about six weeks to review a first plan set, usually an additional four weeks upon return. Sometimes it's a month or two before they return the plans. You know, plan set process can take a few months, but it doesn't take years. So, it's possible they, I mean, if they have all their ducks in a row, they could start next year, but that's really a better question for the applicant in terms of when they intend. They, pro they probably have a pretty well thought out plan of when they intend to move forward. Now, in regards to open space, open space happens in two different ways. It happens through city zoning or it happens through a private open space easement or conservation easement. Though if the property is not zoned open space right now um, and we're not aware of an open space easement, um, but we should look at the maps and verify everything. Since we're doing a subdivision map, we'll have a full title report. We'll have all the information and data. That hasn't come up yet, um, but it's worth looking deep into that. Sometimes when a property owner is told it's open space, they just mean, hey, it's open and it's space, but not really open space. <laughs> so gotcha. it may have been misconstrued. I hope not. Um, you know, but that's something we should definitely do the research on. You know, why were they told that? That's an interesting situation. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe we can get uh, Scott Mercer back on. He can he can uh, answer that question for us about about the timing of the project if he receives approval by the planning commission. Yeah, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the way that this would, would work is, um, as was alluded to, there are financing issues and things to straighten out. Our next step, um, as far as concrete um, hurdles um, for project development, would be that probably next spring, March, in, in March probably, um, we would be turning our plans in for the California tax credit uh, body for to, to try to get the tax credits for the for the project, and that process after we turn you know the application in for that, it's three or four months before we know for sure if it, the project gets tax credits or not, and so that's when we would probably be you know beginning to develop construction documents and such. So it wouldn't be until next summer that we would begin starting construction documents, and so you know it it's, would be well over a you know a year even if everything goes right the first time. Um, be well over a year before construction would start, certainly probably close to a year and a half. And that is if, if, if we get the tax credits, if they're awarded um, right away. If, if, if not, we you know reapply or something like that, then it kicks it back up to an entire year later. Um, with regards to how long the length of construction, it's, I, I'm not gonna even try to guess on that, and, but it's in everyone's best interest for construction to, be, to go as quickly as possible. Um, general contractors with their general conditions, commitments, and bonding, and everything else. Like, um, yeah, it's they always want to go as quick as possible. I mean, I, again, I don't even want to try to guess as to how long construction would, would take. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate your your information. Okay, we'll bring this back to the Planning Commission for any additional um, discussion here. Dennis. Now, uh, this question from Mariah, please. Um, 
you had uh, an exhibit that shows uh, trees that are being removed. Could you go to that, please? Yes, right here. There you go. And in your presentation on trees, you said there were a range of tree sizes uh, from 12 inch, I believe, to 50, uh, uh, maybe a 50 inch diameter tree or so. Uh, do you know where the largest trees are located within this particular exhibit? Um, let's see, I believe that 50 inch tree is, let me see, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the arborist report. Eight. So that the largest tree, the 50 inch tree is this one right here. And uh, of the 15 trees that are being removed, what is the, the typical diameter of the tree? Um, I, I'd have to do the math, but I think it's safe to say it's probably around 20-ish. I mean, it, maybe. Number of trees, then? I mean, there's, uh, there's one 50, there's one 50 inch tree. There is the, mm. there are, and so the average would be uh, what, 16 inch, 12 inch of the remaining? Mm -hmm. I can do the math real quick. I have the arborist report here if you want to know the average size. Removed. Not necessarily, just kind of generally. I think if you could just look at it and say, you know, again, it, when we when it was presented, there was uh, there was a range of trees. The largest being fifty inch, but there's only one fifty inch tree, correct? Yes, there is a forty seven inch tree, and that is right here. So there's another large tree, um, but they range fifty, twenty six, sixteen, fourteen, eleven, sixteen. Okay. If you look at the satellite picture on Google Maps, you can see that there's two significantly larger trees, those two that Mariah pointed out, and the rest are relatively small. Um, but I don't think that you could really, I mean, it would it would significantly decrease the size of the building to try to save those trees, which oh, I yeah. think is terribly, terribly unfortunate. Um, but at the same time, this is one of those developments where it's desperately needed. Yeah. So we had a discussion also on development review um, uh, on the the end of the U shapes. Uh, there are staircases. There are some units, uh, portions of units along the back, but there aren't a, a large number of windows that are looking towards the back of the property from the buildings, and. Mm -hmm. If I recall, that is right. Floor plans. Maybe, uh, maybe we could do a spinoff on, on Dennis. I, I, I like how you're bringing this up. Actually, um, they do mention they have a landscaping plan. Maybe we could put a condition or on the conditional use on their tenure when they go for the resubmittal that we check up on their landscaping plan just to make sure that one they've maintained and that it's equal to what was there before at least. Maybe something in that ballpark. Bill, how does that happen with, with current projects if they are conditioned to do landscaping do, and uh, does the city come in and check on it periodically? We do have project conditions we often put on there to maintain landscaping in a healthy, thriving manner and that there will be follow-up and that they need to replace any dead or dying vegetation and that they you know, are not to trim the trees to a spot that reduces their canopy and, and you know, allowing them to grow. Um, now, in some older projects in the Tascadero, we didn't have those conditions and we've had a lot of issues. So yeah. we can do follow up. It's difficult because, I mean, look at the size of our city and the size of our staff. Um, yeah, it's really difficult to do follow up, but it's good to have a condition so that in case there's issues in the future, we can come back and say, hey, you promised to maintain these trees, but it looks like they've been removed or you've hacked them to such a small size that 
they're never going to really do anything on this property. We've got a couple of, a couple of shops. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it now, but we can a, condition a monitoring plan that, uh, um, you know, there'd be annual reports for a particular period of time provided to the city uh, by an arborist and say for like the county has a, such a such a uh, requirement for uh, replacement of oak trees and it's usually five or seven years yeah in which uh, annual reports have to be presented to that the makes city. sense I don't know if it would be annual but maybe every you know two to three years after two to three years let's give us analysis and then three years later let's see you know if there was two of them over a six-year period that seems to make sense um you know, as a check-in. Yeah, because I mean, one of our findings, we got to try to balance the topography. And I mean, both Tori and Dennis both brought up the points. I mean, there are some substantial trees. We don't want to prevent them from being able to build and really hamper them. But I think Dennis, I think that's a genius idea. Like, good job, man. Do we have, do we have any conditions like that currently in our, in the conditions of approval? We don't. We don't. And that's kind of a new, that's a new one. Um, it's a there, good idea. Well, there's no specific um, timeline, but there is a condition that uh, the landscaping be kept neat and continuously maintained in a healthy and thriving condition. Um, so that's a little bit more vague, but if you want to set a timeline or something, we can beef that up a little bit. Um, how would that be implemented? Who would do that? If we were to put that condition, would the city have to put a tickler together? Is it on the developer? That would be on the developer. Um, they would need to follow up with us in that time. And we'd start that clock at the completion of the project, yeah. at the final occupancy of the project. I could support a, uh, a three-year check-in on the vegetation. Uh, regarding the, uh, we, there's quite a bit of discussion regarding the uh, balconies. And um, the architect was pretty clear on what the, the applicant felt about balconies. Any uh, sense on that from the fellow commissioners? I, could we review uh, both the conditions? It was 23 and 24. Can we see those, please? He was requesting balconies be struck from 23 and the elimination of 24 completely. So I do have these up on the screen there. Um, I hope they're large enough. I'm not yeah. sure. Okay. So in 23, you can see balconies in the very last line. And then uh, 24 is more of an emphasis on, on balconies. Mm -hmm. uh, again, he's was exactly requesting balconies ready. struck from 23 and 24 entirely struck. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I can see why that is. I, that, that was one of my questions is, what amenities does the other one provide? I, uh, they, I assume there's no balconies. Uh, they have smaller, even less open space there, it looked like, based on the number of units. So did that come from the DRC or was that the city suggesting that directly? Uh, that wasn't a DRC. Condition. Okay. Is, we mean, had talked about there being um, more articulation or uh, there some of the some of the facades were were flat appearing on the diagram that was provided uh, and so uh, it was recommended that um, the uh, project move forward from the DRC with the understanding that the applicant would work with the development review uh, community development department and providing um, uh, concepts of what arch uh, articulation could be added. Um, yeah, it, I have a hard time personally, like just supporting this fully striking it because the precedent would be setting 
by completely striking it is just because the old didn't have this, then we can't have an expectation expectation of the new. And one of the things we're looking for is architecture. I mean, is that's I, I've seen that argument a lot in construction. Well, the last person didn't ask for a trench to be 18 inches deep, 30 inches deep. Um, so the precedent of setting of just completely striking that. I mean, the city put that there for kind of a reason, and I, I, I like honestly for the population there they are kind of isolated. I mean, so we really got to think there's that's, that could be taken a lot from a lot of people. Well, and, and how many people are really going to move to the back lot for a balcony? I mean, is that, is that really an amenity worth moving for? Well, so um, Mariah, the condition looks like it's, a, it's a, a balcony to at least one story. So does, is that just for the first floor? The intent there, I think what we're looking at is really just on the second floor on some of those units having balconies as an architectural feature and as an adjunct to open space. And the thought is maybe, you know, some of these ground floor spaces that open up to the courtyard could also have access to that courtyard. And when we mentioned balconies, we were only talking about envisioning, you know, a four foot deep. Yeah six foot wide space where you could open a door and stand out there, not have a big space or a big patio. We're just talking about a really tiny space. Um, Four by six. Is is <laughs> Some yeah. of these spaces when you have patios, they're, you know, whatever the minimum threshold for landing is, which would be yeah. uh, three and a half feet. And then the width of the, uh, the sliding glass door or you know, whatever yeah. that is. Um, are we able to, right now, 24 is undefined, uh, add additional balconies, uh, balconies to at least one story along the outdoor patio, uh, with outdoor patios on the first floor. Could we say uh, the addition of balconies every, every fourth unit or you know, something to uh, provide a, uh, a limit on the number versus having a balcony at, at every room along the second floor. Um, I mean, by, do, by doing this, are we creating an unequal situation for, you know, residents that might want to live here? You know, some, some have, I mean, they're going to be, this is all low or very low income. I'm curious as to what the rents are going to be. Are they going to be more because you have a patio? Well, that that's why I was asking about how HUD would work with this. Because, I mean, generally, I mean, usually they have the voucher. And from what I understand, they're kind of made a hole in a way. So, like, if they were, are they incentivized to charge more? Because the concern that he's having is from a private capital standpoint. And, I mean, I'm all for property rights, but also it's, we're, we're trying to take care of these people. i got to kind of balance that. Like, I... I Ugh. I mean, I could be wrong. I may have misinterpreted that. I think that's one of the reasons that we have these come before this uh, committee to, in order to, a uh, commission to, in order to, to, to flesh these things out. Otherwise, we'd have nothing but gray buildings with, you know, flat walls. Um, you know, so I, I'm all for uh, balconies, especially on the inner courtyard area. Uh, it would provide a sense of community and, and people would be able to, to leave the inner dwelling of their house, especially if they can't get out and get, get to a park or, you know, we're, they're isolated. And yeah. we're trying, we're looking at this to be for elderly people who don't have a lot of uh, mobility or ability to get out very often. So um, a balcony would, might be the, a world of difference, especially if they have, you know, I don't know if they allow pets, you know, cats like to, you know, go out on balconies and stuff. Um, so I know from experience and, and you know, having been around people who, who live in these, these housing developments that that's the only time they get to be outside is either their patio or their, their porch. They're not usually uh, doing a lot. So it, it's really, a, really, a, a, I think, a, something that I would like to see on, on all the units. I don't know if that's feasible or not. And that's one of the things that I would almost require, and then uh, definitely a shuttle service, some sort of requirement for a shuttle service, you know, uh, 
I'm with you on that. And uh, and then the, the landscaping reporting uh, to just maintain the the, the trees. I don't know if the, they could uh, do a probably a three year reporting. That would be uh, something that I would really like to see. Uh, I don't see a, you know unless anybody can give me a, a reason why those couldn't be done other than just a reluctance to do it because of the the, the California Manor one. So bring that to an ask. We're kind of moving away from, I mean, again, the development review committee was talking about articulation. Staff came up with, with balconies. Uh, we also have in, in condition 23, a discussion of, uh, of awnings uh, included uh, as a way of articulating things. And it sounds like we're moving from articulation to more of a um, kind of a, um, something that, that helps survival ship. You know, we, we have outdoor areas because some people can't, uh, uh, don't get outside. I mean, the other side of that coin would be is uh, we want people getting outside and we should discourage balconies so they walk out the front door and walk into the courtyard instead. Um, if, if, it, if it's a life type issue that you're referring to, I don't know, it's, it's difficult because uh, again, if we do, it seems like if we're gonna do it, then every unit needs to have a balcony and that's not the intent of what was being discussed okay. at the development review committee. And how do we pick which ones get it, which one doesn't? Uh, and uh, some certain peoples will have the amenities and be able to step outside and other people can't. I mean, it, it, it just seems unequal. Yeah, but striking it also is just as bad. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it, we, we're considering this for a reason. I, I, I understand that we don't want to uh, take away incentive, and incentive for them to you know, not make it nicer. Um, but Jason's got a big point. I mean, this, we got to think about this community and when we're talking the 55 and up and 62 and up. Um, some of them that might not be an option. They might be people who need help down the stairs. Um, I mean, that's exactly what they're marketing as is this is senior right at that retirement cusp. And the balcony seems like it's actually a big, a, a pretty big deal. Um, the city put it there for a reason. So that's, I, I mean, I, I get where you're coming from because you're thinking, where's the, where's the glass ceiling on this, right? Because you don't want to see it be uh, mandated, right? Where everyone is expected it because then they're going to be like, so I guess my question is like, how, how can we balance it? Um, here's a question for Phil and Mariah. Um, California Manor One does not have the balconies. How many units do they have, and what is their occupancy in those? Uh, they've got what ninety something. What, what's the number of units, Mariah? Not, Ninety-five units right now. Um, and occupancy, as far as uh, how many are actually rented? Yeah, is it pretty much full occupancy? Uh, you know, I don't know about that. Maybe the applicant could weigh in on that. Just, just a question because, you know, obviously we need the, we need the senior housing and somehow seniors have been moving into places that don't have balconies uh, before. Um, just a question. Um, and I think, um, I don't know if you want to open it back up, but it looks like Scott Mercer did raise his hand again. So if you just to make you aware of that. Okay, we'll open the public comment up again for Scott. Yes, thank you. Just really quickly. Um, we thought that, that during the design review committee um, hearing that, you know, we, we heard them when they were talking about you know easier access to the courtyard and such, and that's that's why you know on this on the second and third floors we added those you know community accessible balconies which um, on the floor plan during Mariah's presentation we we had updated that floor plan but I think it just the newest version just didn't make it in there. She did have some um, 
in in the presentation some of the the 3D renderings of those, but it's 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 hard to see, you know, um, exactly, you know, how big they are and such. Um, if you could go to those, though, they're about 110, 120 square feet each, so they're not huge, but they're they're you know size. We'll have a couple chairs out there. People can meet out there and 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 whatever. Um, yeah, it was. I think you had them, Mariah. Didn't you have a the three D? Yeah, I think go back another one. I think it might have been there. Maybe not. <laughs> it was there. I thought I saw it at some point. Maybe maybe I I was pretty sure I did. But anyway, yeah, those again. You know, so we have four community balconies that are you know about 120 square feet apiece. That are you know on the second and third floors. We have access to the courtyard. You know, at four, not including the community room at four other locations on the first floor um, access points you know we're trying to give access but yeah pretty soon it becomes a okay and then you know if everybody has a balcony or not nobody has a, only a couple people have a balcony it does become a, a matter of you know unequal you know whatever but and again i know you people don't want to hear about you know costs and things but you know 76 balconies is not insignificant of, a, of an amenity and again not to be, you know, classist or anything. I'm, I'm not. I really have a, you know, I, I what I do partly what I do in these projects because I, I do. I care about, you know, housing and low income housing and senior housing. It's a thing I have a passion for, uh, that I had since architecture school. I, I these. It's why I do this type of project. Um, we're trying to deliver a good quality project, um, but we can't have the same. Frankly, we just can't have the same number of amenities as. For you know market rate things where like the, the the numbers just just don't work out. I know nobody wants to hear about that. I want it to be a fabulous project. I'm you know we have architects. We do have a little bit of you know a pride thing going on, to bordering on arrogance times. I, I want it to be a great project. I don't want to be attached to a project that I think is is isn't good quality. I think it's a good quality project. I think it's highly needed, as Tori as Ms. Keen pointed out. It is it's going to go a long way to meeting the community. You know. The goals that the city has, you know, we want. We'll add our, you know, there we go, a little bit. We can zoom in a little bit on it. It's hard to tell. And again, they're about eight feet, eight feet wide, seven feet, eight feet deep. Anyway, they're, you know, again, not huge, huge, but they're, you know, there's four of those. Um, again, I appreciate that you guys are discussing that. You know, the committee's the commission is discussing the pros and cons of this type of thing. I, you know, we'll work with the city on adding some, you know, vertical, you know, like you said, the uh, shade, you know, some rigid shade can up, you know, things. But again, I, I just think it really does come to down to, again, you don't want to hear about the numbers thing, but the, you know, the amenities for something like this just can't be quite at the, you know, at the same level as, as, you know, market rate type things. And I, um, we're doing what we can to make it, you know, really nice. And um, that's all. Thank you. Right. Um, um, and I think just from staff's intent here, it wasn't the idea to have balconies on all these units, so, nor was it an equity issue discussion. It really was about architecture, character of the building is viewed from within and offsite. And really just looking at if there was something that broke up the mass on this second floor, whether it's awnings, balconies, or a combination thereof, that was the intent. And as we look at this view also, it's a good perspective. If you look at the, go back to that last one, look at that courtyard. You've got these windows and a building that dies right into the courtyard. If there was opportunities for these folks to access from their units out to this courtyard, that was the other thing is access. And yeah, there are gonna be units that are slightly better than others here. There's already, already you're gonna have units that are larger or have better views than others. That's just how these projects are. They're not all the same. But that wasn't the that wasn't the intent from staff was to make some superior to others. The intent was to add architecture to this building, but at the same time add features that, you know, maybe for a few of the units, whether it's a half a dozen or a dozen, um, there is an amenity, there is something, there is, you know, natural light and air and more of that opportunity um, rather than having the hotel motel project. We were really certainly not trying to substantially change or increase the cost of the project. Um, we thought it was a real subtle um, addition just for a few of those spaces. So, but I think at this point, it's up to the commission. I think um, 
and um, whichever way you find. Question for Phil. Um, yeah. Did the city have a concept of an approximation of like, what would, if they, you know, like if you could get a certain amount of number, did you guys have an approximation of balconies you wanted? No, really it was about that middle elevation and, you know, hey, if there was literally, you know, 12 or okay. 10, I mean, that was really it just to break up the mass of the building um, in a few locations where there's, for example, on, you know, this, the center courtyard area, if the units that were, you know, further back in, they, they had some of those sticking out. We're only talking about sticking out what three or four foot. We're not losing open space because of it. Um, okay. But it's really more of an architecture feature on, on just that wall. So that wall is in the direct vertical line. Um, and there's something that really punctuates that. Um, and, you know, perhaps the same could be accomplished with some awnings. There's no awnings on this project. And I wouldn't do, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't do balconies and awnings on all of those windows. That's a lot. But I would certainly choose a certain wall plane and a certain elevation to have a couple of those punctuated on there so that it gives you some variety on this building. Okay, so then, then we're kind of we're kind of in the uh, wheelhouse of kind of what Dennis was suggesting earlier than having at least a, a limited number on the suggestion. Like, and there will be yeah. lots of trees too. I, I wanted to point that out. This doesn't show those inside the courtyard, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, that uh, this particular rendering is is denuded for landscaping. I mean, uh, picture landscaping within the courtyard and how that would change uh, at least the ground level. And as trees and landscaping matures, how uh, there'll be less uh, flat areas, uh, perceived flat areas in this air in this view. Maria, can you bring up the landscape plan, please? There was the detail, the other detail that was nice. Was there one that was just the courtyard? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it looks like they have border landscaping. I mean, if we, if we require them to put in patios off, off these units and that interrupts the vegetation as well. Yeah. Um, I did like the size of the three balconies, the, the public balconies. And I think the public area is really important, uh, especially for a senior, be able to meet with others. So maybe the ground floor isn't as um, reasonable with how their landscaping plans designed yours, is that kind of how you feel on it, or that's kind of that's what I'm I'm thinking just because the uh, you know <laughs> yeah I, I I don't know that I'm I'm so much in favor of the ground floor uh, patio, but um, I do agree that we need to, you know have some kind of shade structures on the walls just to kind of break up that vertical elevation. And away from the tree, the potential trees that are going to go in there. There is also a bit of a security risk with having an yes. extra entrance. That is true. Um, coming from mm -hmm. the courtyard on the ground floor. Um, so I, I, especially with this this courtyard landscaping plan, um, I think kind of interrupting that, adding other entrances into the courtyard, while great in theory. Um, you know, it does add a security issue, having another door to have to lock, especially if it's a glass patio door, you know. So I could definitely justify that. Um, I think taking out requirement 24 that requires balconies might be reasonable, but leaving it in 23 as an option, um, as an architectural design, you know, a little tiny balcony outside of a window that maybe not be accessible, but is used for architectural design, you know, should still be an option, I think. It says, you know, can include, but is not limited to. Um, but I don't, 
I don't necessarily think we need to get rid of it from 23. We could just keep it as an option I mean, and start I, at 24. I've even seen fall balconies on buildings like this. I mean, uh, yeah. one foot deep, you know, type things. I mean, just to just provide the articulation. I did have a question about the awnings, though, really quick. Are we talking about, like, permanent awnings? Or are we talking, like, cloth awnings? Or is that up to their design? You're muted, Bill. <laughs> I know. I didn't say anything. Oh, I was just musing my just hand to say, just yeah, shrugged. it's up to them. I mean, okay. we didn't really, um, you know, if I were them, I would do a permanent structure that's yeah. made out of steel so that it, it's not having maintenance. But I mean, it's, yeah, uh, an awning, a cloth awning would do the same thing. It's the thing they only last, you know, a yeah. decade or so. I think, I think based on the quality of the project, I don't think that they'll go for a cheap alternative, I would hope. Wink, wink, Scott. No cloth <laughs> awnings. I think Scott was. I, I don't like cloth over. awnings. I wouldn't put cloth awnings on there. Fabulous. Rigid, 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 rigid ones that are also shade structure type things and that looked really good. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. And we can add that to the condition as well, just to make it clear. clear. And no cloth. Yeah, awnings. no cloth awnings. I think. Um, <clears throat> unless there's more discussion, I can. I'm happy to make a motion. Yes, please, Tori, please make the motion. I just wanted to add one real quick. Oh, Jason. I didn't mean to stir the pot. <laughs> and at the same time, my, my goal was to give people the opportunity to have that feeling of outdoors. So if, um, you know, faux balconies and being able to sit the window and look into the courtyard, if it has the same effect, I'm all for it. So, all right, go ahead with your motion, Terry. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me find this the thingy here. Okay. Hold up here as well. Okay. Um, I move to adopt the draft resolution approving a conditional use permit to construct a 76 unit affordable senior housing apartment building and a subdivision map to split the lot at 10165 El Camino into two parcels. Uh, at the tentative parcel map AT210014 um, and striking condition number 24 for the addition of balconies to be required and adding to condition number 23 that there are no cloth awnings. And just to check in, Tori, do you also want to add in the condition about a, a three-year check-in for the vegetation? Oh, yes. Yes, let's go ahead and add that. Can I get a second on that? We need to restate that condition about the three-year check-in. Could you restate that, Tori? Uh, so yes, and adding the condition for a three-year check-in on the state of the landscape, that it is being maintained in a healthy and, what's the other word? Thriving manner. Thriving manner. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. To clarify that, then that would be uh, applicant and arborist or something would be providing a re report to the city or how is that check-in to be done? that the property owner provides a report to the city that the landscape has been maintained in a healthy and thriving manner every three years. I'll make the second. Okay, thank you. Annette, can we get a roll call on this please? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Vice Chairperson King? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Commissioner Hughes? Yes. Chairperson Van Den Eickhoff? Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, everyone. I was hoping we were going to have a split vote. It's a, the super majority thing that we had before. <laughs> it is close. It's close. It's splitting hairs on this one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, we the, have, uh, do we have any commissioners' report comments or reports? Um, if not, we'll turn it over to Phil. And Phil, you're going to give us some information on uh, SB9. Yes. Let me give you a little chat on SB9. Um, the governor's, governor signed that into law just a couple of months ago. Uh, it doesn't take effect till January 1. 
And in, in essence, Senate Bill 9 allows residential property owners to subdivide their property in half, even if that subdivision doesn't comply with the zoning standards. It also allows them to build two units on each of those new lots. And um, it's a little different than ADU law. Um, and the law seems to indicate that you can't use the ADU law and this law at the same time, in other words, to create a series of units on a property. But essentially what it does, it allows for one single family property to be developed, uh, subdivided and developed with essentially four units under SB9. It's really interesting. And it doesn't have a minimum lot size requirement. Well, I think it does, it's so tiny, it doesn't even matter, it's irrelevant. But it does require that that subdivision be essentially half, roughly half. I think one lot has to be no, no less than 40% the size of the other. And it does require that that property uh, be owner occupied for a minimum of three years after that. So it's really interesting. It only takes, it only takes effect on properties that are considered within an urbanized zone. Now in Atascadero, part of our city is outside of an urbanized zone. And that part of the city is generally west of uh, Portola Road, sort of the west upper side of our city is outside of the urbanized zone. So the big chunk of our city that is not gonna be eligible for doing SB9 lot splits or SB9 additional units. And um, where it is uh, implementable, um, there are you know things that the city can do to um, curb SB9 when there's you know significant health or safety issues as declared by our building official or um, if there's sensitive um, archeological resources, historical resources uh, and other topics. But essentially the city, um, we're prohibited from doing CEQA because it's a ministerial act um, and it's a, it's a non-discretionary action. So in other words, they wouldn't require planning commission approval to do this lot split or to do these additional units. It wouldn't require anything but whatever objective design standards we decide to adopt. And so we can adopt objective design standards that clarify um, basic things like setback or, and well, within certain limitations, design of the structures, things like that. But um, it's very far reaching, it's very broad. Um, it hasn't been fully interpreted yet. A lot of cities are coming out with interpretations. We are gonna be going to the city council December 14th with our interpretation. We've been working with our city attorney to vet um, the new policies and we'll be creating an urgency ordinance at first to really kind of really kind of narrow down the field a little bit and then following that within the next six months we'll create a permanent ordinance but essentially our urgency ordinance will prohibit SB9 from taking effect on properties that are not served by sewer um, we're also looking at certain properties in the city that have very limited road access where there may only be one way out. Um, it does seem that in SB9 that regardless of the fire hazard zone, as long as they build to the current fire safety standards, that they still may be able to use SB9, which is interesting. So um, I think a lot of things have sort of been overlooked in the state law, but they're mandating we, we take these into effect. And um, it's, a, it's a little painful when you when you know, you've been doing planning all, all these years and you're trying to get a good general plan together and, and accommodate health and safety issues and logical density and logically, logical emergency evacuation routes and all these things. And suddenly you've got you know, potential properties that could have uh, four units where you had envisioned one. So um, it's gonna be interesting. A question it's be for interesting. you, question Phil. Um, yeah. How is, water figured in this because we have a mutual water company out of city operated water uh can't they limit that well they're gonna have to get water meters and at some point you know we're gonna have a, a capacity issue and it's the same thing with wastewater you know our wastewater treatment plant is at capacity right now um we're facing a, a significant retrofit of our wastewater treatment plant that's going to be a problem um but there's a lot of issues when it comes down to police services, fire services, roads. Um, there's a lot of you know potential issues. Now, I don't know that we're going to get flooded with inquiries on this. 
um, because of the owner occupancy. It's not like an investor can go in and buy a dozen properties and do all this. It has to be an owner occupied site. Um, well, you, you said you mentioned that it was three years after the development, but there's none, no requirement beforehand. So, no, it's, it's basically you must remain on that site for three years. How do we enforce that? I don't know yet. <laughs> so <laughs> basically you say, hey, I'm going to do an SP9 lot split. You've got to be, uh, you know, occupying that property for three years. So in other words, one applicant couldn't come in for multiple properties and in, in, in effect do SP9. That's the only way we can afford, enforce it. Yeah. One property owner can only do one property. Um, and then three years later, they suppose they could do another one um, if they own it. So it's interesting. Um, I mean, the ADU law essentially allows you to build two units on your property now. I mean, you can build a junior ADU and an ADU. And if your ADU is less than 750 square feet, you don't even have to pay development impact fees. So this is another way the state is saying, hey, we need more housing. We're desperate for housing. We think cities are too restrictive in, in what they're doing to allow for housing. But the only restrictions we have are because of resource issues, really. They're because of fire safety issues. They're because of wastewater issues. They're because of, of um, service issues. And the fact that we're a bedroom community and we have an imbalance of housing compared to jobs. So is it a good idea to add a lot more housing to communities like that? Probably not. But anyway, that's not up to us. The state has already predetermined that. <laughs> Still, this is what they're doing. So it will create some development in Atascadero. I'm thinking that, you know, a lot of folks just enjoy their property. They're not going to want to do this situation. Um, and for a lot of the bigger properties on the west side, it's just not going to be eligible anyway. When you start looking at the area of, in the city that is actually served by sewer, it's not significant. I mean, a lot of our city really is on septic. And... Um, and then, like I said, a lot of our city is in this area that's not an urbanized zone. Um, but there will be a lot of properties, for example, in the vicinity of like um, Marchant Avenue, Kerberil, um, around Atascadero Lake. Um, you know, in those areas of Atascadero Avenue, um, some of those areas like that where there's a lot of infill lots, those could be potentially eligible. Again, though, I mean, a lot of houses are in the center of a site. So to subdivide that in half is going to be a challenge, you know, so. So we're going to have um, an urgency ordinance that's going to take effect on January 1st that will put a, a limp, it will prevent SB9 lots from occurring for, until the ordinance, to the urgency ordinance dissipates, correct? Here's what's going to happen. Um, we're going to adopt that urgency ordinance on December 14th, and it's going to stipulate where and when SB9 can take effect. So we're not going to stop SB9 from taking effect with that urgency ordinance. We are going to prevent it from being implemented on properties that aren't served by sewer. We're going to prevent it from being done on properties that aren't safe. Uh, we're going to prevent it on properties that are historic, such as colony lots, colony house lots. And this code allows us to do that. The SB9 says that you can, um, on a locally listed historic property, um, not allow for SB9 to take effect. Now, interesting fact is we don't actually have an adopted historic list. So another caveat of this is we are gonna move forward with um, designating a historic list for all of our colony home sites. So that's how already- that's already a general plan policy and a general plan program to do that. We just haven't gotten around to that yet, but now that's become more urgent. To protect so the it. definition of an urbanized zone is not being created by the city, no. but it's being created by, uh, by uh, the state. By the state HCD. They've or, already done it. Yeah. And so every, every county has urbanized zones that have already been designated. Exactly. So if I have a, a lot that is not have um, sewer access, uh, yeah, but it it's large enough to meet uh, the state water quality control board definition for subdivision, which is two acres. I have a four acre lot, uh, not on city sewer, 
but within an urban zone, I could I could subdivide it based on the requirement of providing septic and because I have a two acre minimum. I'm, I'm sure our, our lamp probably addresses yeah it does that that issue. And again, we need at yeah. least two acres, right? Yeah, we, um, so during our urgency ordinance, um, we are not going to be allowing implementation of SB9 on any lot served by on-site septic system. And with that the, is what we are going to refine when we move forward with the permanent ordinance is whether there's a uh, capability to do that with lots on septic. Okay, and <laughs> the urgency ordinance will have a sunset on it of some type? They only last six months. Six months, okay. So we're talking then uh, June, June 14th. Yeah. And then could another ordinance be uh, adopted then? Yeah. Yeah, we'll work on, as we see more interpretations of SB9 and we refine the logic, uh, we'll, we'll adopt an actual SB9 ordinance section for our zoning code mm -hmm. that clearly implements the state policy. Okay in a legal fashion. And the state's gonna to wanna to review that and make sure we're being nice. <laughs> okay, so. well, uh, thank you. Uh, lot so there it is. So, yeah. yeah, it's gonna go straight to city council. Um, so I'll get you a summary of that too. That We actually have that almost done now. We were gonna go <laughs> next week, but we just need to dot some of the I's and cross some of the T's and we'll get it rolled out. And we'll put out a little, we'll probably put out a little handbook or a little um, couple of brochures on this as well um, for property owners as to how they can interpret this, this new law. I know that extending a sewer would be expensive, but if a property was to, let's say, provide sewer to their property, then potentially they could develop under SB9. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So Phil, when are we meeting next? Do we have anything scheduled? I don't know that we have anything scheduled. I thought we had something for December, but it hasn't really gelled yet. So we'll see what's going on. We'll keep in touch. Okay. You know, do you know of anything, Mariah or Kelly? I don't think, or Annette, I, don't, I can't see anything on that. I don't think no. we have anything December 7th um, for planning commission. I think that's the next date, but no, nothing yet. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a very nice Thanksgiving next week. <laughs> and we'll you see all you when well. we Happy do. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Happy it's Thanksgiving. It's also my birthday, so don't oh. forget. Happy birthday, <laughs> Tori. Happy birthday. birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, Good night. everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.